I want to talk about Padre Pio. I'm not quite sure whether this is a suitable subject for a home retreat, but I've been much preoccupied with it and would like to share this interest and the related questions. Padre Pio was a Franciscan friar from Pietrocino in southern Italy, and for most of his life he was located at the Frari in San Giovanni Rotondo, where he died in 1968. He's probably the best known of all stigmatics and is credited with numerous cures of illness and with preternatural knowledge of facts and the future. During his lifetime, he was widely regarded as a saint, widely invoked and yet a controversial figure. He was several times investigated by ecclesiastical authorities authorised by the Vatican. On two occasions, he was sequestered, that is, forbidden to celebrate Mass in public or to communicate with his followers. But this sequestration was withdrawn after two years. Two other phenomena, unusual phenomena, are associated with Padre Pio by location and a sweet aroma. Padre Pio is an extraordinary instance of the overt action of God in history, transcending or bypassing the usual processes of life in response to this individual who is especially close to God in prayer. One instance of this is the number of healings which occurred in answer to Padre Pio's prayers. He did not himself necessarily touch the sick person, but it was when Pio had prayed for them that they were cured. This often combined with a visit by Pio to the person, seemingly in bilocation in some ways, or even merely accompanied by a special aroma associated with the wounds he bore. Perhaps the most striking of all Padre Pio's preternatural gifts was his ability to see into people's minds and tell them the sins they were reluctant to confess. My personal interest is special because I visited Padre Pio with my mother in the long summer vacation after my first undergraduate year at Oxford. It was on my holiday before solemn profession in August 1957. I remember vividly two incidents, the Mass and the Blessing. We attended Padre Pio's Mass at an altar in the open air. Everyone was trying to get a glimpse of his hands, but they were mostly concealed by the long sleeves of his alb. I vividly remember that as he held up the host before communion, there was a volley of clicks from cameras and Padre Pio let fly quite forcefully in Italian that there should be no photography at this most sacred moment of the Mass. After the Mass, we went into the Frari, and as Padre Pio passed down the corridor, he stopped to bless me for my solemn profession in the following month, as I knelt there. My aim is to discuss what we should make of Padre Pio's claims to sanctity. There are stories of Pio already as, as a boy, hearing angels sing where the church at Pietrocino was later to be built. I would immediately dismiss these as typical of stories foisted on great men and saints in their infancy, like finding a swarm of bees in the mouth of the baby honey-tongued preacher, Chrysostom. I would also dismiss out of hand stories of the flying friar, that is, the flying friar seen by some aviators on their way to a bombing raid in southern Italy, preventing them dropping their bombs on unoffending civilian targets. Quite apart from the absurdity of the scene, a flying habit alongside or in front, horizontal or vertical, apart from those, such a desertion of orders would surely have to be reported and would have left a record in easily accessible military records. So, 
Padre Pio in prayer. Is the whole thing a massive fraud? In so far as we can make any judgment, it must start from a consideration of Pio's life as a whole. Some claim that for long periods, Pio was entirely sustained by the Eucharist and had nothing else. However, he was a well-built or even heavily built male with a massive workload. Would he have survived? Solution? He had secret sources of food hidden under his bed. The truth is more complicated. There were certainly periods in his life when he could hold down hardly any food, especially in his early time as a friar. It even looks as though they may have been self-induced or even historic, hysterical, or at least neurotic, ways of avoiding living in community. And again later when he was called for military service, in the First and then the Second World Wars. However, several times he declared how he longed to live in community. And once he'd settled at San Giovanni Rotondo, he took a lively part in community life, sharing the food of the community, sparingly and healthily, preferring fruit and salads to heavier fare. His superior writes, he eats some of everything, but just a little bit, for example, vegetables with oil. There are stories of conversations and jokes at mealtimes, and even of playing handball games during recreation after lunch. At one time, Pio said he annoyed the brethren. Why? Because his jokes were so bad. The many examples given are typical of clerical jokes. Find the first time in their context, but distinctly tired, one must admit when related on paper. Perhaps the most telling of all is at the end of his life, in September 1966, the guardian of the community could write, he has lost most of all his high spirits and vivacity. He speaks very little. He very rarely behaves as he once did, telling stories, jokes and witticisms. So he clearly had a sense of humour which he exercised in the community. In line with this, it's clear that Pio was a model religious. There's never a word of complaint nor of disobedience. He cooperated fully in the several investigations, even though he hated having his stigmata examined. At least two of the investigators were, as de Fitt's investigators, initially hostile and unsympathetic. The chief difficulty is that Pio was not interested in analysing the phenomena. He and his parents were of intensely pious stock and prayerful peasant stock, and they were content simply to pray. Prayer was his whole life and his whole joy. He writes to his confessor, Hardly do I apply, apply myself to prayer than all at once I feel as if my heart were possessed by a flame of living love unlike any flame of this poor world. It consumes, but gives no pain. It is so sweet and delicious that the spirit finds great pleasure in it, in such a way that it does not lose its desire. O oh God, this is a thing of supreme wonder to me. On another occasion he writes, only God knows what sweetness I experienced yesterday especially after Mass. If only now, when I still feel almost all of his sweetness, I could bury these consolations within my heart, I would certainly be in paradise. How happy Jesus makes me. How sweet his spirit is. He continues to love me and draw me closer to himself. Again and again, when questioned, for example, about his bilocations, he refused to say in what way he was present when bilocating. He just says, yes, I was there. But not whether this was physically, mentally, spiritually, or what. He was simply uninterested in the mode of presence. He said, I only know that it is God who sends me. I do not know whether I am there with my soul or body or both of them. 
ask God and not me. All I can tell you is that I always try to remain attached to the thread of his will. Padre Pio didn't lose his sense of humour about this either. When asked what language he spoke on these occasions, on, this tra on his travels, he replied, Italian. And how many miracles would you like the Lord to perform, he said. The stigmata of Padre Pio. In the Middle Ages, devotion to and sharing in the passion of Christ was an essential and central part of Christian spirituality. One would expect that the form of stigmata for a Franciscan would be related to that of St. Francis of Assisi, who received the stigmata two years before his death, an acute form and a result of devotion to the passion of Christ. The exact form of stigmata varies from person to person, even to the location of the marks themselves. For example, the body wound can be either on the left or the right side. The hand wounds on the hand rather than the wrist, as now seems historically more likely. This does suggest that the phenomenon is related to the psychology and imagination of the stigmatist. The official description of Francis' stigmata comes from two disciples, Thomas of Celano and Ugolino. They said, pieces of his flesh taking on the appearance of the heads of nails and also their points, bent, beaten back and rising above the rest of the flesh. It's wonderful to see in the middle of his hands and feet, not the punctures of nails, but the nails themselves formed by his flesh. Pierre's wounds were entirely different from this nail-like formation. There were two forms, early and late. The early form, shown to the archpriest Pannullo, was, who was like a father to him, is witnessed clearly. Already soon after ordination, there's a preliminary sort of stigma which appeared within a month of Pierre's priestly ordination. There are therefore three moments of the stigmata which will need to be examined. This early mark, the full stigmata, and the remains in death. The term stigma, plural stigmata, is first used in a religious context by Paul. I bear the marks of the Lord Jesus in my body. The first stigma on Pio appeared on the 7th of September 1910. Puncture wounds in the middle of each hand, a centimetre in diameter, given to him by Jesus and Mary when he was praying outside in the fresh air, front and back and apparently right through. Pio regarded them as an annoyance. He said, let's pray together and ask Jesus to, to take this annoyance away. These wounds went away after several days, but reappeared exactly after a year, said to be the size, the size of a small coin, accompanied by a strong, sharp pain in the middle of the red spots, some pain also in the soles of the feet, as he writes to his superior. Secondly, the classic period, which started in 1918, a wound four centimetres across, covered with or formed by bloody matter, with the edges turned up, attesting their tendency to fall off. All around the spot there is something like a rose of light-coloured blood that adheres to the skin. Same front and back. No hole, central or lateral, but the blood that coagulates in these scabs comes out of the skin itself through exudation. Pain intermittent, but especially Thursday evening to Saturday morning. This comes from the examination of his wounds by one of the investigators, Bishop Rossi, later a cardinal, reliable investigator. 
At first, Pio applied intermittently iodine or petroleum jelly, but he soon stopped. He never seems to have commented on them and simply to have been slightly embarrassed. When asked whether they were painful, he said, So do you think the good Lord gave them to me for decoration? Typical Pio humour. He said he could not clean off the dried blood or the cutaneous membrane would rip off and there would be more blood. According to the report by his close friend and secretary, Father Dominic Mayer, in 1949, so a lot later, Pio was intensely secretive and embarrassed about them. At night, he wears white gloves, says, says Dominic Mayer, frequently bloody in the morning, which Pio washes himself in his own room. He washes his feet in the corner of the kitchen. He's obviously embarrassed by them. Side wounds bleed continually, so that it was necessary to change the cloth two or three times a day. Then the third stage of the stigmata. The foot wound disappeared in 1966. The side wound stopped bleeding and healed in 1967. The hand wounds began to heal after Easter in his last year in 1968, and they were gone by midsummer. When examined and photographed at his death, there was no sign of the scars or change in the uniformity of skin colour or texture. Medically, there were no scars or abnormalities to suggest that they'd ever been there at all. This would suggest that the marks were real, but dependent on Pio's own psychology, a precious testimony to Pio's devotion to the Passion of Christ. But when there was no psyche, there was no wounds. There's neither time nor need to compare this phenomenon to other instances of stigmata. Then, Pio's bilocation. There are numerous stories of this. I quote only one, the story of Cecil Humphrey Smith, written up by Cecil himself. He worked for someone called Bernardo Patrizzi on a tomato farm in North Italy. The two were close friends, based originally on a shared interest in heraldry. Cecil was a knight of Malta, brought into the church by his wife, whom he married in 1951. In 1955, he had a serious accident, a serious road accident. In the evening, a friar visited him in his hospital, coaxed him into a very detailed confession and administered the sacrament of the sick. He seemed to be dying. For seven years after this, Cecil continued to, to suffer periodi periodically head-splitting headaches without any medical solution. But in 1962, Bernardo Patrizzi took him to Padre Pio's hospital, of which he was a trustee, and Cecil immediately recognised Padre Pio as the priest who had administered the sacraments on his presumed deathbed. As th though Pio had not left the monastery at that time at all, Pio then tapped him on the head and all the pain immediately disappeared. The two built up a close relationship. Pio called him Linglese, being unable to cope with his double-barreled name. And he, says Cecil, bilocated to visit us in England in times of stress and sent perfumes of consolation and encouragement on many occasions. The mention of perfume, a special aroma of flowers, is a regular feature of the miracles and presence of Pio, regarded by many as evidence of his presence, equivalent to a bodily presence. In the investigations that have been mentioned, it's a regular feature that Pio is accused of having secretly applied various perfumes, but no proof given. This relationship with Cecil included several miracles 
such as the cure of a cancer patient on the morning of the patient's impending operation and the date of birth of an unexpected daughter. There was obviously repeated contact and presence between the two of them, though actual quasi-physical presence is not clear. On the 23rd of September 1968, from midnight till 2.34 in the morning, they shared Pio's final struggle as he died, so that when Bernard rang him from Rome later in the morning, Cecil was able to tell Bernard himself of Pio's death. All this was written up and published in a little pamphlet which I have. So what is my conclusion? There can be no doubt that Padre Pio had a very special link with the Lord in prayer, which issued in extraordinary powers. His prayer was such that the Lord answered his petitions in a special way, not always, but frequently. The frequency of the claims cannot be dismissed as chance. In some way, he was often physically present to those for whom he was praying. In his personal life, this light-hearted and humorous friar was a model religious and model member of a community, but so close to the Lord in his prayer life that this was somehow reflected in his acceptance of the wounds of Christ. His stigmata were real and physical, but in some way dependent on his mental and neurotic or nervous condition, because they disappeared at death. They expressed his real devotion to the Lord Jesus and his passion. For me, the most impressive mark of his sanctity was the combination of this devotion with his humility, his humour, common sense and his goodness to his own community. Padre Pio, pray for us.